Sandwiches, huh? Oh, we're talking about the bread and water. We're talking about the bread and water. Jesus used vigilance. Oh, you want vigilance? All right. So you want to take a song, but we'll turn to page 219 with it. Going home to sing and tell his story. 
us thanksgiving in our hearts. So thankful, Father, for this beautiful day that we had to enjoy and then be able to close it out and worship to you. We pray, Father, that you will continue to be with us as we not only go through this worship service, but through our lives, that we'll always do those things pleasing in your sight. We ask our blessings, Father, upon those who have been mentioned here today as being home ill or going to hospitals for surgeries of various types. We pray that you will be with them and get in the strength and the comfort that they need to recover from their problems, their health problems that they're undergoing. Be with the doctors and the nurses that will be ministering to them, <clears throat> that they'll do just those things for speedy recovery for them. We're thankful, Father, for those who have had surgery and operation, been back in the hospitals, but they are now back with us once again, and we're so thankful for that. <clears throat> we pray for your richest blessings on them, that they will recover even more fully <clears throat> in the future. We ask our blessings, Father, upon our country. We pray that things can be said or done that will turn this country around to get it going back to the, in your direction rather than away from it as we seem to be going at this time. And we pray, Father, for those who are trying to stay close to you, that you will continue to be with us, that we'll have the strength and the courage to stand up against the evils of our day. We pray, Father, that you will be with us in our upcoming gospel meeting. I pray that you will be with the speaker as he's preparing the lessons, that he'll have those things that's most needful for us to be hearing and be able to place into our lives and be with each member here that uh, we will be inviting and helping to bring others to the services during that time, that they will be able to hear them also. <clears throat> we pray that you'll continue to be a brother Tory as he stands before us from week to week to bring us lessons from your word and pray that he'll have many more years of service in your kingdom and be able to teach many people. Continue to be with us now through this worship service, throughout our lives, and Father, forgive us for all our past sins. Help us to look for that way of escape that you so faithfully promised us if we'll only open our eyes and look for it. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. <coughs> <coughs> Turn to page 511 and we'll sing that before the Lord's Supper for those that you have an opportunity to partake this morning. 511. <coughs> Ought we come together, ought we sing and pray, here we bring our offering on this holy Thank you. 
to die. We are grateful for this bread, which is emblematic of his body. And we pray, Father, that if we partake of it, that we might do so in a worthy manner. <clears throat> for we ask it in the name of your Son. Amen. May I see your hands, please? fruit of the vine, which is emblematic of the blood that Jesus shed on that cross, that uh, we might have the forgiveness of our sins. Be with us as we partake of it, but we ask it in Jesus' name. Mark page 454 in your song books up there and taste the song. Brother Tori speaks to us this evening. And after you have that, Mark, turn me to page 708. 708. Let's stand and sing this song. <clears throat> Walking in sunlight all of my journey. 
What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the, in the desert, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Good evening, everybody. It's great to be here. Thank you, Mr. Kent, for that good scripture reading. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is the master teacher. Jesus, time and time again, was able to teach eternal truths in such a simple way that everybody could understand. The common people heard him gladly. And one of the methods that the Lord employed was using object lessons, things from real life, things that people were very, very familiar with, in being able to teach great eternal truths from those very simple, everyday, common items. Many of the Old Testament prophets would also use objects. They would use visual aids in their preaching to help drive home the points that they were making from God's Word. Now, I thought that I'd do the same thing this evening, given that we're talking about the bread of life. Now, I guess I've gained somewhat of a reputation around here as eating a little differently than everybody else. That might be the case, maybe not. But I buy this specific type of bread that many of you probably are not familiar with. It's called Ezekiel bread. See, it's biblical. It's from Ezekiel 4.9. And it includes many of the different sprouts that they say that were used uh, in the Old Testament and so forth. But this is the type of bread I like. And this is a loaf of bread. Very common everyday item. And you probably buy bread on a weekly or bi-weekly basis as well. And from a loaf of bread, a few loaves of bread and a couple of fishes... Jesus is able to teach the gospel plan of salvation. And that's what we're going to be looking at this evening. In John chapter 6, of course, the chapter is far too long for us to talk about all of the verses in any level of detail. But in the beginning part of this chapter, you have the miracle of Jesus of feeding the 5,000. And many times in the book of John, what you see is Jesus will perform a miracle or a sign. And that sign or miracle will be immediately followed by a discourse, a sermon from the Lord. And this chapter is no exception. And so in this chapter, you have all of these disciples there. There are about 5,000, the text tells us, and they have nothing to eat. And so finally, the apostles go around and find this lad who had five barley loaves and two fishes. And the Lord was able to feed over 5,000 people on that day from that small amount of food. Obviously a, a miracle. And so he feeds the 5,000 with the bread and the fish. And then later on, he walks on the water. His disciples go across the lake and have been on the lake for a couple of uh, miles. And Jesus approached them in, the, in a storm and they were frightened by his appearance. And he told them not to be afraid and they welcomed him on the boat. And so the, 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 the small band of disciples, the twelve, and Jesus here on the other side of the lake, and the multitude who had just been fed are still back uh, where they were left. And they realized that Jesus and the apostles were gone. And so what they did is they went looking for Jesus. And so they uh, boarded uh, some boats and began to look for the Lord and the apostles. And that's, uh, that's what brings us to about verse 24. Uh, it says, When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping... And came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? 
And so now they approach the Lord, and it's in this context that Jesus is going to set forth this great sermon that he is the bread of life, the living bread. And so if you have your sermon guide, I hope that you do. I've broken this text down into really three main areas, and there's some overlap in the text. Uh, Jesus goes back and forth between some of his arguments, but the three ideas that I want to draw out in particular are in the first place, we're going to see that Jesus is the bread which fills forever. In the second place, we're going to talk about the fact that he is the bread which came down from heaven. And in the last place, we're going to talk about he who eats of this bread of Christ abides in God. And so there's, those are going to be our three kind of broad points, and we're going to uh, set forth from there. And so we're going to begin in about verse uh, 26. And before we start getting into the text of verse 26, I want to come to the very end of this context because it's going to help us to understand the things that we're going to be reading. If you look at John chapter 6, look at verse 63. This is towards the end of this discourse, and he has this to say. He says, It is the spirit that makes alive or quickeneth. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The teachings we're going to be reading about are spiritual teachings. They're not physical, literal teachings as his immediate audience may have thought. And just like Nicodemus thought when Jesus told him he had to be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. He was thinking in purely physical terms. But Jesus is telling us outright that the teaching is spiritual. And so we need to keep in mind as we go through this that Jesus is employing symbolism. He's using spiritual analogies and he's communicating spiritual truth. Also, before we get into this text, it's important for us to understand that before Jesus ever uttered a word, he fully, fully understood that his message would be rejected by many that were standing there to hear him. He knew that beforehand. Uh, verse uh, 61 and 62 tell us that. He knew that there were many there who would defect and would no longer follow him. He knew that before he uttered a word. And so Jesus knew that beforehand. Keep that in mind. And so this is one of Jesus' many discourses in the book of John. And my job tonight is to get out of the way and let Jesus preach to you. My job is to go through this, try to break it down, make some things that might be a little difficult to understand at first glance, maybe a little more easy, go to a few cross-references. But my job tonight, and it should be all the time, is to get out of the way and let the Bible speak. And in this case, let's let Christ preach. And so let's begin in verse 26 here. So he is the bread which fills forever. And here in verse 26, we see the motives of the crowd exposed by the Lord. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, Ye seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Basically, you sought me because you're hungry, because you liked uh, being able to be filled by me. They were after the material blessings that Jesus did in fact offer. And so Jesus understood their motives. He says, you're not coming here because you saw the miracles. You weren't inspired to believe me because of the sign you saw. You're here because you were impressed that you were filled. That was their motive. And so their motives are exposed right from the outset. And then he goes on to say in verse 27, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath the, uh, God the Father sealed. And so he tells them that the work that God desires is for them to believe. The reason we know that is because in verse 28, they said to him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus said, Don't strive and work after the, the food that perishes. Strive after the food that leads unto, uh, unto everlasting life. So they thought that there was something that they can do meritorious to get this food that will lead unto everlasting life. And Jesus responds to them and says in verse 29, Here is the work of God. This is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. And that ties back into our purpose for the book of John. The whole reason this, uh, all 21 chapters of this book uh, were written was so that we might believe, and that believing we might have life through his name. And we talked a lot about the nature of belief so far, and we'll continue to do so as we go through the rest of the book of John. But belief has more to do than mental assent. We, we understand that. This is an obedient, trusting faith that God is after in us. And so that's the work of God that Jesus is drawing attention to. You need to have faith. You need to believe, verse 29, on him who, who he has sent. He's referring to himself. Christ is the one that God 
has sent. And so the work that God desires is for mankind to believe in Christ. Now, in verse 30 through 33, we're going to see that the sign that they're requesting has already been delivered. They're going to ask for a sign. Jesus is making claims that they can have everlasting life by believing on him. They want something to confirm that message. Notice here in verse 30. They said, therefore, unto him, what sign showest thou then? That we may see and believe thee. What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And so apparently they had on their minds, perhaps because they had just been fed uh, by the loaves, uh, for whatever reason, they had on their mind the account of the Exodus, when the children of Israel were brought out of the land of Egypt, coming into the land of Canaan, and they wandered for those 40 years. And for those 40 years, God sustained them. And gave them life. He, he, he provided water for them out of the rock. And he also provided manna for them. It would come down every day from heaven. Little pieces of, of bread. Little, little uh, pebbles. They looked like small stones. And the word manna actually means what is it? They didn't know what it was. So they said what is it? And that's manna. That's the Hebrew term. But it's referring to God's sustenance in providing for them in the days of the wilderness. So they were thinking, okay, well, Jesus, if you're claiming to give everlasting life, at least do a greater work than Moses did. Moses at least gave us a sign of man from heaven every day. So that's what they were looking for. But they didn't realize that the sign, the very sign that they were requesting was standing right in front of them, speaking to them. Because in verse 32 it says, And Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not bread from heaven. It wasn't Mo of Moses that you had that bread from heaven. It was from the Father. That was from God, not from Moses. But my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. So he's shifting from the past tense into the present. First of all, it wasn't Moses that did that. It was God. And that same God has given you the true bread who is standing before you. So the very sign that they were requesting had already been delivered to them. And then Jesus goes on. In this teaching, let's look at verses 34 through 40. This is really the heart of the chapter, if you were to ask me. This is the, the, the heart of Jesus' teaching, that he is the bread of life. And so they wanted this bread evermore. That's what they said in verse 34. Lord, evermore give us this bread. This reminds us of who? The Samaritan woman at the well. Remember John chapter 4? He talked about how he would give her water or a well of water where she would never thirst again. And she thought he, would, you know, she, uh, he was talking about a physical well where she would not have to go every day and draw water from it. Thinking in purely physical terms, and so were they. They were interested in this food. Remember what Jesus said back in the beginning in verse 26? They were after the food. That's what they were impressed with. That's what they were after. So they said, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. And so Jesus is identifying himself as being his true bread. I am the true bread. Here I am. If a person comes to him and that term cometh denotes a continuous action. You see that in the King James with the ETH that implies a continuous action. He that comes and continues to come to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And so if only the one who comes to Jesus has his hunger satisfied and his thirst quenched. And the person must keep coming. But then he turns the attention back on the audience. But I said unto you, you also have seen me and believe not. You haven't come to me for the right reasons. You don't believe in me, at least not yet. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. So in other words, God's giving the individuals the opportunity to hear Jesus preach, to hear the word set forth. And those that come to him, that respond to that word, Jesus is saying, I'm not going to cast you out, I'm going to welcome you. That's the opposite. I'm going to welcome you. You can come to me. If you want to eat, come eat. If you want to drink, come drink. I'm taking you in. For I came down from heaven. He is the one that came down from heaven. In the Old Testament, that manna came down. Jesus was the one that came down in the incarnation, John 1, 14, and dwelt among men. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but to do the will of him that sent me, the Father in heaven. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, 
but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And so here we have the promise of those who feast upon Christ, the bread of life. That's equivalent to believing on him, having everlasting life, and also the promise of the resurrection at the judgment day, the resurrection to life. John chapter 5 and verse 28. Now, some have read into this verse some sort of a predestination Calvinistic teaching where God has pre-selected individuals since before they were born to either be saved or lost, and those ones he selected will somehow, outside of their own will, come to Jesus and they would be the ones who would be saved. That's how many people teach this verse, but that uh, verse 40 teaches directly against that. The will of him is that everybody would believe. That's God's will. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, uh, you know, let's look at that together. Let's look at what God's will is. His will is that all men should come to repentance. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. Here in this chapter, Peter is talking about the events surrounding the end of the world. The events surrounding the end of the world. And many people were doubting the Lord's coming, the second coming, because it had been so long in their minds that they lost faith in that promise. And so Peter is standing up against that, telling him, telling them that God doesn't count time like we count time. Uh, verse 9, one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. But then in verse 9 he says, The Lord is not slack or slow concerning his promise, as some men count slowness. But his long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The will of God is that all men should come to repentance, respond to the word of God in humble, obedient faith. But the reality is not everybody will do that. That's God's will. That's what he desires. But not everybody will do that on their own. And so let's. That, that's, that's, that's verse 40. So that kind of concludes our first section. He is the bread which fills forever. He is the bread of life. And so after Jesus got done saying this, there's a little bit of a response by the crowd again. Look at verse 41. It says, The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And so you can see these individuals who are very prideful and very uh, arrogant about they're being Jews. And here is this, this man from Galilee saying that he's the true bread and he's higher than Moses. That he's the true bread from heaven. He's greater than the manna that was given to our forefathers. It's kind of a little bit of irony here that their murmuring, their grumbling actually mimics the, gr uh, the grumbling and the murmuring of the children of Israel in the wilderness. Uh, time and time again, Exodus 16 2. Exodus uh, uh, 16, 8, and 9 talks about the children of Israel grumbling and murmuring and complaining every step of the way. And in fact, even after the manna was given from heaven, they would go on to complain about God's provision. Numbers 11, 4, and following. And so here they were doing the same thing that their forefathers did. They were grumbling and murmuring at, murmuring at the provision of God, scoffing at the offering that uh, God had given to them in His Son. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he said, I came down from heaven? In other words, we know this man's family. We know his humble roots. We know he's a carpenter. What's he talking about? He came down from heaven. Apparently, these individuals didn't understand the incarnation, that he wasn't the physical son of Joseph. But that was what was in their mind. So here, Jesus answers them in verse 43. And so... In verse 43, Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So nobody can come to the Son except the Father draw him. Now again, many people have taken this verse and make it sound like God has only selected certain individuals and only draws certain individuals specifically to come to the truth. And only they will actually respond in humble obedience. Oh, is that my phone? No. Okay. All right. Anyway, um, <laughs> let's look, 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 at ver look at verse 44. If you look at the word draw, when it says, the Father which has sent me, draw him, that is parallel to verse 45. 
No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Then he says, it is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. How does God draw people? By teaching, preaching the message of the cross. They shall all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Isaiah chapter 54 in verse 13. God draws us by his word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And so the Father draws people to him by the teaching of the cross, the teaching of Jesus Christ, the teaching of his inspired apostles, the teachings that we have recorded for us in our New Testaments. Verse 46, Not that any man has seen the Father, save he that which is of God, he has seen the Father. Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. There's that repeated phrase. That's what he had just said in verse 40. And he repeats again, I am that bread of life. Verse 48. And so the Father draws mankind to him by his word. Ultimately, the whole self-expression, the complete, perfect word of God is Jesus Christ himself, right? In the beginning was the word. Jesus is the word. He was the ultimate self-expression. And so he gave us the word, and then, of course, the words that Christ taught and the Holy Spirit taught through the apostles. So the Father draws mankind by his word, but not, notice also in verses 48 through 51 that Jesus is reaffirming that he is superior to that manna in the wilderness. He says, your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. <coughs> he could point to this example, this piece of evidence. Look, yes, manna was from God. It was mediated through Moses. Yes, absolutely. But guess what? Those individuals who benefited from that physical food, they're dead. They're in the tomb. They've died. What's Jesus going to say? This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. He's saying the bread that I am, the bread of life, who eats of me will never die. They have eternal life. Will live eternally with God. So in saying that, he's making himself greater than the manna in the, in the wilderness. He says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give him is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So in a sense, this bread, this bread of life, is that which Christ gave us on the cross. He said... It's the flesh which I will give for the life of the world. Of course, referring to the cross of Calvary. His suffering and his brutal death on the cross for our sins. John has already presented Jesus as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. John chapter 1 and verse 29. His sacrifice was voluntary. Jesus did so willingly because it was the Father's will. He did so voluntarily and he also did so vicariously, in other words, on our behalf, referring to the cross, verse 51. So now the Jews are really stirred up, in, uh, beginning at verse 52, and this will mark the beginning of our third and final section tonight. He who eats this bread abides in God. They had a misunderstanding about what Jesus was talking about. He's talking about eating his flesh. And again, they're thinking physically, right? They're thinking that Jesus is teaching that people literally have to eat him. They may not have thought that that would really happen, but they couldn't understand it any other way. And so in verse 52, it says, The Jews therefore strove among themselves. They were confused. They were arguing, quibbling back and forth. And you can just visualize this. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus is going to give them another answer. Verse 53 says, Then Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. You have to eat my flesh and drink my blood to have life in you. Not physically, spiritually. Whoso eateth my flesh. Again, notice that continuous action. Whoso eats and continues to eat my flesh and drinketh my blood, whose drinking and continues to drink, has eternal life. And I will raise him up the last day. Now, if you make notes in your Bible, I'd like you to either draw a line between these two verses or make a cross-reference on verse 54, but tie this back to verse 40, a verse we've already looked at. When Jesus says, eat my flesh and drink my blood, 
That's a metaphor for believing on him. Because if you look at verse 40, it's essentially the same sentence. But instead of talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, it talks about believing on him. Which shows us that verse 54 is a metaphor for verse 40. Verse 40 says, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. Verse 54, 54 says, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up the last day. So to eat of Christ's flesh and to drink of his blood is to hearken to his teachings and to believe him. Again, respond in humble, obedient faith. Verse 55, For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Now, notice verse 56 here. Let's notice verse 56 together. And we're going to see here now that not only that one must eat of Jesus' flesh and drink of his blood to have eternal life, in other words, hearken to his teachings and by his word and believe, but we're going to see next in verse 56 and 57 that the one who eats of Jesus' flesh and drinks of his blood abides in Christ, abides in him. Verse 56 says, He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Christ dwells in the person or the people who hearken to his word, believe him, and humbly submit to his will. I'd like you to put a marker here and look with me, if you would, to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 24. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 24. Same author, well, it's all the same author, it's from the Holy Spirit, but same human penman that penned the gospel according to John also wrote the verse we're about to look at. Let's all turn together to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 24. 1 John 3, 24. And notice the parallel here. Verse 24, the last verse of chapter 3 says, And he that keepeth his commandments, commandments of Christ, he who keeps his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. And so we see the parallel to this verse. So in verse 56 it says, He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwells in me, and I in him. And 1 John chapter 3 and verse 24 says, He that keeps the commandments dwells in him. And he in him. So again, we see that eating of Christ's flesh and drinking of his blood has nothing to do with the physical. And this passage doesn't have primary import to the Lord's Supper. It may have some undertones, it may have some foreshadowing of that, but that's not what's under consideration in these verses. Jesus is setting forth bread and drink as a metaphor of keeping his commandments, believing him. And that's how we know that believing is a synecdoche or a representative of keeping the commandments of God, humbly submitting to his will, joyful trust conjoined with obedience. So in verse 56, it could just as easily say, he that keeps the commandments dwells in me and I in him. Verse 57 says, as the living Father has sent me and I by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he <clears throat> shall live by me. So the one who eats of the flesh of Jesus and drinks his blood or keeps his commandments, believes in him, humbly trusts him and obeys him, that is my phone, um, is the one who abides in Christ. And you could really, I mean, he summarizes his teaching in verse 58. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead, but he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Jesus is the bread of life. The multitudes of people sought Jesus for various reasons. We don't know exactly what those reasons are. We know at least a good percentage of that crowd sought Jesus because they were fed by him. They were after the physical blessings that were associated with following Christ. But we're going to notice here from this text as we brought this to a close that this teaching of Christ splits the audience. And that's what we're going to see time and time again in John. We've already seen it. Christ teaches the truth, and men have a decision either to disobey it, not believe it, or to believe it and obey it. So let's look at the end of this chapter and see how people respond 
to the teachings of the Lord. If you drop down to verse 66, you'll quickly learn that from this time forward, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. <coughs> the teaching was too hard for them, apparently. In verse 60, it says, Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? They didn't mean it was hard to understand, but really that term should be better translated something like harsh. <coughs> this is difficult. This is a hard truth to understand. This is a hard truth to accept, rather, not understand. So it's a harsh saying. Who can hear it? Who can accept it? And so from this point forward, many of his disciples didn't go with him anymore. Why did they leave? Well, some may have left because they were more interested in food than spirituality. Perhaps some were more interested in a political kingdom, and they knew Jesus wasn't coming to bring that. As soon as they found that out, they didn't want to follow him anymore. Perhaps they were interested in Jesus using miracles to manipulate people, and when that didn't happen, then they were turned off. Perhaps that was the case. Perhaps some of these were unprepared to come to the Lord. Jesus wasn't telling them just to kind of accept that he's the bread of life and go about your everyday walk as if nothing ever happened. He's calling them to a radically different lifestyle and belief system. Many people were not ready, and many people today are not ready to answer that call. And so many were probably unprepared to relinquish their own sovereignty and authority and what they believed to be right. And many people were probably offended. You know, Jesus was kind, he was gentle, but he also taught the truth. And the truth has a tendency to offend, doesn't it? You know, he used his examples that were very offensive to Jews. The idea of eating flesh or drinking blood was something that was forbidden in the law of Moses. And so many people probably took offense to that, as we see in some of their responses. Making himself greater than Moses was something that would have been very offensive. It would have offended their sensibilities, their preconceived religious ideas. And so for whatever reason, many of these disciples turned away. And we could look at those same reasons for why many turn away at the teachings of Christ today. Now, here you have Jesus just getting through with this incredible sermon. And there's only that small band of disciples left. And he looks at them, and he asks them a question. Will you also go away? 67? Simon got it right for once in his response, didn't he? Many times he, got the, he had the foot-in-the-mouth disease, where he spoke before he thought things through and... Uh, was rebuked by the Lord, but this time he gets it absolutely right. Simon Peter stands up and answers him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. They knew where to go to for eternal life. In verse 60, uh, 69 says, And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. They were convinced, based upon the evidence that Jesus has set forth. So as we think about that, we think about the fact that we need to be partaking of Christ's flesh and of his blood, his teaching. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3 in the old law tells us that man shall not live by physical bread alone, but by every mouth of word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's the very scripture that Jesus quoted when he was being tempted of Satan in the wilderness during those 40 days. You know, as Christians, we have to continue to come to the Word of God. We're imbibing spiritual food. We're imbibing Christ. And we have to continually come with the attitude that we're going to do His will. And continue to believe and obey His Word. So the question for us tonight is how will we respond to Jesus' teaching? Many of these people went away. They couldn't, they couldn't take it. They weren't, they weren't willing to follow Christ. Now, what did Jesus teach? Jesus taught that... People have to eat his flesh and drink his blood, referring mainly to the hearkening and believing his teaching. Keeping the commandments, 1 John 3. Jesus taught that man must repent. We've seen already a few times in the book of John, and we'll see some more, where Jesus will heal somebody or have an interaction with an individual, and he'll say, sin no more. That's basically repentance, a change of mind to stop sinning and to start living for God. Jesus asked that of mankind. 
Jesus taught that one must confess him, Matthew 10, 32. If we confess him before men, he will confess us before his Father, which is in heaven. And Jesus, before anybody else, taught that baptism was for the forgiveness of sins and absolutely necessary for salvation. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16, 16. Those words are still there. Jesus also taught that one must continue, even after they become a Christian, to come to him and continue to believe in him, verse 35, and keep eating and drinking his word, verse 54, to have eternal life and to be able to dwell in Christ and to have Christ dwell in us. Now, if you look, if you go back through John chapter 6, there are some tremendous statements that are said about people who do that very thing. In this chapter alone, the person who does those things that Christ has specified has eternal life. Has it so sure in prospect that it could be said that they possess it in the here and now. That's what's said about people who eat his flesh and imbibe the bread. We have the promise of being resurrected. We have the promise that whether we die before Christ comes back or perhaps we're here by the, when he comes back, we're going to be transformed. We're going to gather with all the faithful of all generations together meeting him in the clouds like a city meets its victorious warrior. And joining Christ and reigning with him. Christ dwells in us if we've done these things. Verse 56. What greater thing could be said about somebody than Christ is dwelling in them? Also, that person taps into the eternal life giver. Verse 57. God the Father. And we're promised that we will live forever. Verse 58. Will you choose him? Or will you walk away? You can make that choice while together we stand and sing. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus.